Good morning. We're going to try this again. I would love to say there are technical difficulties, but the only technical difficulties were the idiot doing the PowerPoint and stuff. So, All right, back in the Ten Commandments. Got your Bible turned to Exodus chapter 20. The title of today's message is, With All My Heart. With All My Heart. And uh, my grandma used to say, With All My Heart and Half My Gizzard, which... For a long time, I thought that we had gizzards because my grandma said that because my grandma wouldn't lie to me. When I get to heaven, I'm going to ask her some questions. All right, Exodus chapter 20, verse 4 through 6. You must not make for yourself an idol of any kind of of an image or anything in the heavens or the earth and the sea. You must not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God who will not tolerate your affection for any other gods. I lay the sins of the parents upon their children. The entire family is affected, even children in the third and fourth generations of those who reject me. But I lavish unfailing love for a thousand generations on those who love me and obey my commands. Now, the first, the first uh, commandment was all about no gods, no other gods. You'd have no other gods. This one takes a step further. It says, not only should you not have any other gods, don't make any images of them. Don't have any idols. Don't have anything that, that you worship outside of me. So one is about finding the place of where God is and following God. The second thing now is about worship and about worshiping idols because that's what idols are for. They're, they're to worship. Jesus kind of said it a little differently in Matthew 27. You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. A second one is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. Jesus summed up the Ten Commandments right there. Because everything that he said, it's all there. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength. Okay? That, and that includes, so that includes not having an idol, that includes not taking God's name in vain. That takes, all, take care of, takes care of all of our vertical stuff. And then, and then love your neighbor as yourself. That takes care of all the horizontal stuff, all the stuff that's person to person. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. Don't, don't lie. All the things that are there. So Jesus, instead of having Ten Commandments, he said there's two, but they sum up all ten. So we're going to kind of look at some things we can learn from this second commandment. And it gives us some things. So the first thing it gives us is a rule to live by. A rule to live by. Look at Exodus 20, verse 4. You must not make for yourself an idol of any kind of image or anything in the heavens or on the earth or in the sea. God had to give the Jews a very direct command here because they had a tendency, uh, they had a propensity for following false gods. This is what's amazing. Even though God had done some incredible things in their lives, even though they they got manna from heaven and they had had all these things, they'd been led out of captivity. All these great things that they'd watched happen, and they still, when they would find a, when they would find a foreign god, they would get near uh, somebody that worshipped differently, they would just l- say, oh, you know what? Let's follow that god. And then they would get in trouble. They would end up in slavery, and God would rescue them again. And uh, Over and over and over again, you see this, and they had this thing where they just, they followed whatever was shiny and new. And, you know, before we get too upset about the Israelites doing that, we do the same thing. We do the same thing. Whatever's shiny and new. It could be the, I mean, I, I, look, I've been tra- around church for a long time. I've been in the ministry 40 years. I've watched a lot of stuff. For a while, it was the, it was the, the prayer of Jabez. Oh, you got to pray the prayer of Jabez. Oh, and you got to do this, and you got to pray this, and this is the new shiny thing, and this is the new, this is the new minister you got to follow, blah, 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 blah. You know what? I, I just follow Jesus. It's a lot easier. We follow the latest trends the world says is cool. Then we turn to God when it all blows up in our face. The world says it's it's okay to have 
sex outside of marriage. And the world says it's okay to, to do this, uh, to do this, and to do this, and to do this. And we follow it like, oh, that's cool. I can do that. I can do that. And then it blows up in our face. We end up in a gutter. And what do we say? Oh, God, help me. We're just like the Israelites. We are. So let's not cast too much on the Israelites. So now, here's the thing. There's a rationale. A rationale to learn from. Look at Exodus 20, verse 5. You must not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God who will not tolerate your affection for any other gods. I lay the sins of the parents upon their children. The entire family is affected, even children in the third and fourth generations of those who reject me. There are consequences for not obeying the commandment. And we're going to talk about them a little bit more, but there are consequences. If we don't follow God's commandments, there are things that happen, and not just to us. They get passed down to our children. Now, again, this, remember, this is another law. That grace came in and said that we can all be saved. But there are things that we pass down to our kids, our actions, our attitudes. If we're not having godly attitudes, that's what I spoke about to the men Saturday. If we're not aligned under God, then everything under our family is not aligned either. We just had a four-wheel alignment done on the, on the edge because the front tires can get out of whack with the back tires. And so you end up, they call it crabbing. So your back is, it, and it hurts your gas mileage, it hurts your tires and all kinds of stuff. When a trailer is, when a truck is pulling a trailer, as long as it stays straight, the trailer stays behind it. When it starts turning, the trailer has to catch up. Well, when, when our lives are not in alignment with God, we're that truck and we're off track. Now that trailer, it's off track too. Once we get, the truck in line, and the tra- then the trailer will follow. So as husbands, as dads, as, as wives, I mean, as, as family guys, it's important for us to make sure that our lives are under God's alignment. Because then we can do it. And look, I, I, I just put it this way. If you are not living consistently for God or you're just living for yourself, you're influencing others to do the same. You may not think you're an influence. But we are, every, we influence everybody that we, that we come around, whether it's for good or for bad. We influence other people. But there's a reward to look for. Look at Exodus 20, verse 6. But I lavish unfailing love for a thousand generations on those who love me and obey my commands. It's a beautiful contrast to the way God is normally Normally, we think of God as the big blue meanie in heaven, you know, with a bucket full of lightning bolts ready to light, strike us dead at a moment's notice. But here, God is saying, I lavish unfailing love, unfailing, for a thousand generations, if you'll just follow me. I look at my grandfather, tremendous man of God, had a son that went into the ministry, has a grandson in the ministry. The night I was ordained, there were three generations of my grandpa's family on the, on the platform. My grandpa was being honored for 50 years of ministry with the Assemblies of God. My uncle was an executive presbyter, which is a, a high leadership position, and I was being ordained. My grandpa was grinning from ear to ear. But that shows how his, his ministry of goodness, how his life of goodness blessed generations that came behind him. And I, I'm waiting to see what happens to my grandson. I don't know. But I love the idea that my grandpa's faithfulness, and he was faithful, my grandpa's faithfulness passed on to my uncle, to me. All the lives that we've touched all flow from my grandpa's ministry. It's amazing. So I want to shift gear now, but let's talk about maybe the idols that we follow. Now, I don't know if any of you guys have gotten a stick out of the backyard and decided to follow it. You know, decided that maybe I'm going to worship this stick. This is my stick. His, this is my God. His name is Stick E. And I'm just going to, I'm going to follow this stick and he's going to call the shots of my life. We probably don't do that, but we do do these other things. Like, first of all, there's the lifestyles of the rich and famous. Not the one with Robin Leach. I'm Robin Leach. I'm yelling and I don't know Why? We got rock stars, movie stars, sports heroes, teen idols, and they have worshipers who bow down before them. They want to dress like them. They want to do things like them. They want to be like them. My idol growing up 
was Dick Butkus, the linebacker. Got a, got a picture of him in my office. I watched, I watched you know, all the film that I could see, you know, and I practiced the way he tackled. He used to have to, he would get a shoulder into a guy's chest and he'd reach around the, the back of the guy's knees and lift him up and then dump him and fall on top of him. I started practicing that in practice. I got in trouble because the coach didn't like it. He taped, he taped tape around his two middle fingers. I have no idea why, but I started taping tape around my two middle fingers before games just because if Dick Butkus did it, it had to be cool. Who knows? I, now, there's nothing wrong with liking somebody or admiring somebody for their, for their accomplishments, but when we try to emulate them, that's when we start getting into, into problems. See, emulation is when you copy another person and try to be that person. I'll be honest, I tried my best to emulate Dick Butkus. I just thought that was cool. Of course, I was 12, 10. I'm, I'm still a Dick Butkus fan, but I don't want to emulate him. I want to emulate Jesus. You and I can't be friends anymore, Chuck. You and I, you and I cannot be friends anymore, Chuck. Who's Dick Butkus? Oh, broke my heart. Youth is wasted on the young. Exactly, exactly. You can't go to Chicago and say that. I'll show you film in a minute, and I'll show you. And you'll, you'll be surprised. He was the meanest guy to ever play pro football. And that's saying something. <laughs> Possible. Who knows? Who knows? Bubba Smith. Ray Nitschke was that, was that that era? Yeah. Look, when we try to copy the lifestyles of other people, we try to be everything like them, we're, we're running into idle territory because we're not supposed to be like anybody but Jesus. And so this idea that we're going to dress like them, to be like them, and we want, their, we want their cachet, and we want all the things about them, God says, you know what? That's, that's idol worship. You need to be like me. See, the emulation is the worship. And it shouldn't be like that. It's thinking that somehow we need to be just like everyone else. We have bought into this so far, so, so far in our country right now. Right now, if you have a, a voice of dissent, you're like evil. Well, there's a lot of things they say that I don't agree with. I don't agree that a five-year-old boy should be able to look in his pants and think that he's a girl. I don't think that that makes sense to me. Okay. But let me ask you this. Why do you do the things you do? Who controls the way you talk or act or think? And you know what? We've got to be careful. Because if it's not somebody who's looking out for your spiritual welfare, you could find yourself in a bad place. The truth is that too many of us emulate the world and its values. We talk the way they do. We dress the way they do. We joke the way they do. We talk. We, we function just like the rest of the world. That is starting to leak into Christianity where now we have churches that have taken the gospel and the gospel say, thou shalt not. We'll say, well, thou shalt maybe. Look, if the Bible's against it, we've got to be against it. And if the Bible's for it, we've got we to do it. And that's not popular. That's not. Some of the things I said Saturday to the men, that's not popular. That's hard to live by. That's hard words. But we need to do it. The fact is that Christianity in its purest forms, in its most serious historical moments, is all about being counterculture. It's all about being against the grain. I like what Hebrews says. Hebrews 11, 13 through 16, all these people died still believing what God had promised them. Talking about people who had given their life for Christ. They did not receive what was promised, but they saw it all from a distance and welcomed it. They agreed that they were foreigners and nomads here on earth. Obviously, people who say such things are looking forward to a country they can call their own. If they had longed for the country they came from, they would have gone back, but they were looking for a better place, a heavenly homeland. 
That is why God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. That's, if I, my grandfather and my uncle have both gone on to heaven, but if I were to water down the gospel that I preach, if I were to decide that I didn't believe the way they believed anymore, it would be a slap in their face. And I won't do that. Second idol we have, and this is a weird one, the idol of touchy-feely. Touchy-feely. If I didn't know better but listen to some of these gospel preachers on the, on the TV, not that I listen to them very often because I can't take it, but some of these preachers make it sound like God doesn't have a spine anymore. Like he's been transformed to this big, uh, warm, fuzzy, warm, fuzzy God who has just goosebumps for everybody and hallelujah, that there's no standard of living that comes with that. Now look, God is a God of love. But God is not ruled by your feelings. And this idea that somehow our feelings matter. Like, I, well, I don't feel, I had a lady tell me one time, well, I don't feel like, uh, like th- that's a requirement for me. Uh, okay, but when you get to heaven, God's going to say, okay, here are my commandments. How'd you feel about them? He's going to say, what'd you do about them? Laura Schlesinger, Dr. Laura, if you remember her on the radio, the idolatry of feelings becomes evident when we revere and bow down to our feeling state as the ultimate authority and our ultimate identity. I told you I've been in church a long time. And I've, heard, I've heard people say, well, I don't feel led. I don't feel led by the Lord to do that. My boss has a joke. He said, look, Jerry, when it's time for you to leave La Ranch, don't tell me that, God's, that God you know, gave you something. Else. God... God that God is calling you somewhere else. Just tell me you're leaving. Because he's had a lot of guys come up, and the bottom line is they want to go find another job, but, but they want to make it spiritual. I feel, I feel like the Lord is, is leading me somewhere else. Hallelujah. Just, just say I'm going to go somewhere else. Yeah. Just be honest about it. Okay? What's funny is they'll say they don't feel led, even though God's word says this is not, uh, this is not something that you want to do. It's something you have to do. Go into the world and make disciples. That's not an option for us. And yet some people think that that's not their job because, well, I just don't feel, I don't feel like I need to. Beware of making feelings your God. Look, there are mornings I wake up, I don't feel human. It doesn't change the fact that I am, barely. Okay? I wake up, my back hurts, my knees hurt. You know, I've got breath that'll peel wallpaper. I don't feel human. But that doesn't change the fact that I am. We get our feelings in the way of our service to God. We let our feelings, we get bummed out, or I don't like that pastor, so I'm not going to listen to him. If he's opening the word of God, he's preaching the word of God, there's always something you can get. I don't like everybody's style. Not everybody likes my style. I'm okay with that. But if they're preaching God's word, there's always something you can get because God's word does not return void. I like Martin Luther says. Martin Luther said, Feelings come and feelings go, and feelings are deceiving. My warrant is the word of God, not else is worth believing. Don't let, don't let feelings be your God or your guide. If you let feelings be your guide on your daily life, you're going to constantly be riding this roller coaster because our feelings go up and they go down. They go up and they go down. The Word of God is constant. Set your life on the rock, follow Christ, and let Him guide you, not your feelings. But we got people that are dying on the altar of feelings. The altar of touchy-feely. Look at this one. The altar of self. Oh, self. Self-esteem, self-fulfillment. Oh, I've got I've to find myself. How'd you lose yourself? Where are you? Where'd you go? And we get these people that get the idea that their self is the most important thing. Uh, again, I know another Christian who left his wife because he said, well, God wants me to be happy and I'm not happy with her. And I told him, I said, if you leave her, it's sin. There are two Christians. I said, if you leave her, it's sin. Well, I don't, you know, God wants me to be happy. All right, he wants you to be happy with the woman you got. Malachi says you can be happy with the wife of your youth. 
truth be told, it was his third wife, and he left all, all the other ones too. And he did leave her because in the end, he cared more about his happiness. Ooh, happiness. I remember hearing the story about a lady who was really rich, and she had a bunch of houses all over the world, and so uh, she took her maid with her, and so she would go to one place, and then she would get tired, and she'd go to another place, and another place. So a couple of the maids were talking, and they said, so you're, you're, you're the lady you work for, she moves around a lot. She said, yeah, she gets bored. The lady says, why does she get bored? Her, and the lady's maid said, well, because everywhere she goes, she takes her with her. The problem isn't the place. The problem is you. The problem is us. We're feeling, we don't feel fulfilled. Don't reduce God to your personal happiness. In fact, if the thrust of your life is to go after happiness, you're going to find yourself more and more unhappy. Viktor Frankl was a concentration camp survivor. He was held in Auschwitz. I, think, I believe it was Auschwitz. And Viktor Frankl's story is amazing. Amazing how he, he forgave his captors. I mean, just an amazing thing. But I got a quote here from Viktor Frankl, and I love this quote. It says, happiness cannot be pursued. It must ensue. One, reason, one must have a reason to be happy. Once the reason is found, however, one becomes happy automatically. As we see a human being is not one in pursuit of happiness, but rather in search of reason, of a reason to be happy. What reason do you have to be happy? Well, his name's Jesus. And that sounds so trite. That sounds so, so uh, easy to say, but it's so true. We find our happiness in our relationship with Christ. Psalm 128, verse 1 and 2 says, How joyful are those who fear the Lord, all who follow his ways. You'll enjoy the fruit of your labor. How joyful and prosperous you will be. So what leads to this happiness? The fear of the Lord. Look at Psalm 97. Light shines on the godly and joy on, on those whose hearts are right. May all who are godly rejoice in the Lord and praise his holy name. That all comes from God. That, that joy all comes from God. And happiness is fleeting, but joy is eternal. And so we need to be chasing joy because that comes from God. Happiness comes and goes. The next one is stimulation. Stimulation. This is the primary way that we attempt to deal with life in our day. Whether it's, uh, you know, getting alone with with a movie or, or whatever you do to kind of get your batteries recharged. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. The problem is when that becomes our only pursuit. When all your cares fade away with the click of a mouse or the, the match on the end of, of something that, that's going to change your, your state of mind. There's nothing inherently wrong with stimulation unless it becomes a form of escapism. Why are you doing that? To get away from the world. That doesn't work. Excess stimulation can lead to addiction, and addiction, which comes in many forms itself, is clearly idolatry. You attempt to make life more manageable through substances or practices, pornography, alcohol abuse, drug abuse, sex outside of your marriage, all of those things. We use them to stimulate us to to make us feel better about ourselves and to work outside of God's word. And God says, that's, that's, that's idolatry. You're worshiping an idol. I bet you never thought of addiction as an idol. But I have done a lot of crime scenes where we pulled over, you know, we got guys that were meth heads or heroin addicts or stuff and they're, they're stealing, they're doing all this stuff and all because they, all they could fixate on was their next, their next high. Okay, so how's that not your idol? If that's all you're fixated on, that's the only thing that matters to you, you'll rip off, you'll hurt people, you don't care about anything else. Alcoholics that all they care about is getting drunk and staying drunk and it doesn't matter what it costs anybody else around them, it's an idol, pure and simple. You can make work an idol. Guys that, that, guys that 
that work you know, a million hours a week and they reject their families and their kids are raising themselves and their, their wife is home doing everything by herself and, and then they wonder why their home breaks up. That's because your, your, your work was your idol. I'm not saying we don't work. We do work. But I've never stood next to the casket of somebody who said, oh, I just I wish he'd worked more. No, no. The families all wish they'd work less because our kids don't need our things. They need us. It's easy to fall into that trap. I, I, I've done it. So busy chasing our tail after other stuff that it becomes an idol because that's all we worry about. I like this one. Country club faith. In church, we tend to make God too small. Jesus becomes our get-out-of-jail-free card, our get-out-of-hell-free card. He's just, a, he's just our ticket to heaven. He's the power of our crisis intervention. But he's not the one that we earnestly seek on a day-by-day basis. He's just some far-off God that, uh, well, you know, he helps me when I need it. But understand that the help comes with a responsibility. The responsibility is that we need to follow him. If our commitment to Christ doesn't extend past the church walls, we got country club faith. We got faith that is not true faith. We have faith of convenience. We want to have a manageable God. See, it may not seem like such a big deal to have a manageable God, but there are grave complications. Do you have a manageable God? A God that will bend his will to yours? A God that will do whatever you think is right? I don't. And you better not either, because if you do, that's not God. That's, that's your interpretation of what God is, but that's not the true God. Theologian J.I. Packer said that images dishonor God because they obscure his glory for their attempts to create something that reflects the creator. How do you make an idol that looks like God when you haven't seen God? I love the story of the little girl. They're in Sunday school class and they're making a picture and so they're just drawing. And so, you know, some kid's drawing a boat and other kid's drawing a house and one the, te- the Sunday school teacher comes by and asks the little girl, says, what are you doing? She says, I'm painting a picture of God. And the Sunday school teacher says, well, nobody knows what God looks like. The little girl looked at her and said, well, they will in a minute. They will in a minute. But that's, that's your image of God. I don't remember which one of my boys it was came, came running into me one day and they said they were six foot tall which I thought was interesting because I'm six foot tall and I was quite a bit taller than them. And I said, how'd you figure out you're six foot tall? And they said, I made a ruler. Okay. So I went. (laughs) And what they had done, they took a stick and they marked on the wall with the stick their height. And then they wrote six foot next to it. I'm six foot tall. Okay, but it doesn't work that way, Sparky. It doesn't work that way. Your measurement doesn't matter because there's a real measurement out there and it's the one that God has. Guys, we, we've got to live for God. We've got, to, we've got to make sure that we're not carrying around wooden idols. I love this. I love this. Uh, I lost it. False image of God results, results in a false relationship with a false God. Look at this scripture. Isaiah 45.20 What fools they are who carry around their wooden idols and pray to gods that cannot save. I've got a God who can save. A God who can save miraculously. A God who saves without any hesitation. But if you're following any of these other gods, all you have is an empty God that you follow around and that you carry around in your pocket. And what Isaiah say? What fools they are. Ten Commandments, I don't know if you're catching on to this, but it has a very big bearing on our lives and on our day-to-day walk with Christ. They're the basis. They're they're the, the backbone of all that Christ does in us. 
So don't think that they've gotten away from them. We haven't. They're right here. As we try to make God more manageable, our manageable God destroys us because he, that manageable God that you've made up, the six-foot marker that you've made, is not the true measurement. We can do better. All right? Let's pray. God, thanks. Love you, Father. You're, you're good to us, God. But God, we must follow you. Not some idol, not some dude on TV or something we've made ourselves. God, we've got to follow you, the one true God. Thank you for your love. Thank you for caring about us. Could you, you could leave us twisting in the wind here, but you don't. Thanks, God. Thanks for your love, your grace, the mercy you pour on us, God. Now, Father, I pray that you help each one of us recognize the idols in our lives, the places where maybe we've made you manageable and move forward. Thanks, God. Amen. All right, next week.